Hey everyone, Igor and Benji here coming at you from the Contractor Evolution Studio. So today we're going to get into a really cool idea that I find fascinating and I'm going to paint it for you as the story of two contractors, okay? So contractor one is getting ready to sell her business, cash out, and she's looking forward to moving on to the next stage of her life. The business, it's worth a ton of money and it sells quickly and easily, all cash, no subject sale. 13 million bucks, well invested, and her financial life really set up for the long haul. Sounds pretty sweet, right? Now, let's talk about Entrepreneur 2, okay? Now, he's scrambling to find a way out of his business. The company has been reasonably profitable, but now that it's time to retire, it's becoming pretty clear for him that his organization, at least from the perspective of the buyer, is barely worth the value of his physical assets. Now, here's the important thing I want you to realize, okay? Both of these contractors have put in the same amount of effort over the same period of time. Contractor one and contractor two built their businesses over the course of the same 20 years, working the same roughly, let's say 50 hours a week. So how is it possible that one is selling for $13 million and the other one is selling for essentially zero? So the question to ask yourself is who in this scenario do you want to be? If you want to be a lifestyle entrepreneur, work within a business that you love and you created, be the driver of it yourself for the long haul and, and make a good living for yourself, then do that, right? There is a great life and career to be had going that route. But if you are thinking about building a business that can thrive without you, a business of tremendous value, and then translating its yield into your retirement, uh, perhaps another business endeavor, or maybe some philanthropic cause that you're passionate about, there is absolutely a formula to building an entity that has real value in the marketplace. It's also important to realize that you are currently on this journey of value creation, right? And the decisions that you make now are going to influence what you do or don't create long term. Now, to explain this formula, we've brought Kevin Shaw on the show today. He is an absolute specialist in mergers and acquisitions of mid-sized companies. He's represented sellers in a ton of transactions as they've hit the exit points of their business. Uh, and his perspective is fascinating because his whole career is helping entrepreneurs take their businesses to market. More than anyone we've had on the show, he understands what it actually takes to create a company that will be desirable for a buyer. So in this episode, Kevin gives you his insights into what you got to be doing now to cash out later. So some of the really cool things we get into with Kevin. So he tells us about the seven core principles that a potential buyer of your company one day is going to be looking for. Uh, he tells you a bit about how large you need to grow your business eventually before you can even begin to entertain a serious conversation about a high value transaction. And he also tells us, uh, this is really cool, about the single biggest pattern that he sees in highly successful business owners when it comes to their mindset on how they've gone about creating and building their business. So if you're serious about creating a real legacy for the long haul, listen carefully to this super insightful conversation with Kevin Shaw. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Kevin, awesome to have you, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, like, thanks for having me. Amazing. So Kev, you've been in this like small to mid market M&A space for quite some time. Um, tell me a bit about where things are headed in this, in this M&A space. Well, thanks for making me feel old. Uh, <laughs> but yes, I have been in, in it for some time. And uh, the M&A space is white hot right now. I think you're, what we're seeing is a, a, a tailing of the public markets. What happens in the public markets falls down into the private markets. Um, but, you know, as far as the last 10 years go, there has never been a better time to um, sell a business, but also just generally the appetite from more different buyers is at an all-time high, at least from my perspective. So, uh, yeah, I would say that the market in the private business buying, selling, investing is uh, extremely active. And so why is so much capital in the world being deployed towards uh, purchasing or driving value into small to mid-sized businesses? Yeah, it's a, it's a big question and a good one, Igor. Um, so if you think about 
trying to earn a return on your investment, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously holding cash is a bad thing because inflation will eventually make your money worth mm-hmm. worthless. Um, but then people will go and pursue public market returns. Right now, the public market, as much as it's on and up, it feels a little bit unsettled. Mm-hmm. It feels like mm-hmm. maybe we're at a position where there's going to be a dramatic turn at some point. Mm-hmm. Debt markets are uh, returning very low, um, uh, having very low returns, very low yields. And so what ends up happening is uh, people start to seek that yield. Investors, smart investors, and private equity is the way out, um, at least from our perspective. I mean, obviously, it's the world that I deal in uh, quite a lot. Um, but also, you know, I would say that even I think back to my time doing my, uh, my master's degree, um, really, really bright fellow ran my empirical finance class. You know, the class was based on trying to find what that return is uh, in the public markets and if you can predict it. You know, we go through 10 different models. And at the end of the class, the, the answer to that question was, uh, you can't predict the market. And so, uh, you know, I, I went up to him after the class and I just asked, you know, where do you put your money as a double PhD individual? Uh, and he said, this would have been a few years ago now, but he said uh, all his money goes to private equity groups. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think that that, that is catching on. Uh, and so more money's flowing there. And so that money needs to be deployed, which means they need to buy more businesses. Right. Demand. And so if I'm one of those said owners of a small to mid-sized private business, like a contracting company that's doing, uh, you know, generating a million or a million and a half in, in annual returns uh, from an investment perspective, when I'm looking at my own investment, it probably makes a lot of sense to invest into my own business as an asset, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, you framed it in a way that people often don't think about. But yes, Igor, I would say like, if you can put your money back into your own private business, assuming you have a good business that's returning profit every year, that's the way to go. Uh, because I think that more capital is going to continue to seek good private businesses for for buying and selling. Right. Totally. So for for like our audience, you think of um, you know contractor in North America, mm-hmm. whether we're talking like large scale builder, renovator, uh, home service company, landscape roof, or whatever. And you've worked with a lot of these business owners in the past. I know just from your experience, you've you've done deals for large contractors and construction right. businesses. Um, what do you think a, a lot, uh, what might surprise contractors about this world? Are, are there aspects of this that they're unaware of? Mm-hmm. Uh, surprising. Yeah. So what I would say is you're right. I have done uh, a good number of transactions in the construction, in the contracting space. Um for big companies as well as like on the smaller end. Uh, and I think the number one thing that would surprise a contractor is that most businesses, I'm going to go out on a limb and say 99% don't sell really in the way that wow. we're, in the way that we're thinking about it. Yeah. They don't sell for a top dollar. And so, you know, I don't mean to say that they're not going to transact. I know that, you know, it's semantics, but you know, they might transact, uh, dare I say, you know, uh, I don't even want to go here, but on death, right? If you, if, if, if the business owner dies, the business is going to transact in some way. If the business fails, it's going to transact in some way. Um, but in the context that we're talking about selling for top dollar, not just selling for the asset value or not just selling it off to your employees because you have health concerns or whatever the case may be. Um, that is exceptionally rare. So, I mean, just, just the statistical, uh, you know, nature of this, like that, that's a very slim, percentage i can just i think it's safe to assume like this definitely does not happen by accident if, if you want to be yeah. that one percent that does you don't just like yeah. typically throw, a throw contractor up, wouldn't stumble there you no, and you don't just throw up a for sale sign 20 years down the road and and expect to like cash out for a whole bunch of money I, I i think that's probably safe to say yeah i mean i think that the the, the path of least resistance for a business owner is to run your business as a lifestyle business something right. that fits in your life um something that produces enough income that you are happy with, you know, produces income for your employees and you treat them well. Um, but the idea of setting your business up for sale is not a common goal. Although I think this is why it's surprising. Although I think most business owners think that that's what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. And, and to be clear, I think we, you know, you made this point earlier and I think it's a really good one. There's really nothing wrong with creating a brand that you're proud of. And even if it's driven kind of around you making a decent income, you make a hundred K a year, uh, you you do great work, you support a team of employees. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But what we're talking about here is a very different scenario where you're trying to build real asset value into your organization, right? Two totally different approaches. Absolutely. I mean, you could liken it to a house, right? Some people want to purchase a house and live in it and 
you know, run it to the ground and it's pr- providing them a roof over their head. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and they're getting utility out of it in that way. And they're happy with that. Other people move into a house and say, it's providing me this utility, um, but I'm going to reno it. I'm going to put money into it. I'm going to yeah. make this look better so that I can actually earn a bit of a return on it at the end. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a really great analogy. Well, so what, one is, I was, like, want to reiterate, right? Like, one is not better than the other. It's totally no. an individual choice. And there's, and there's two happy, healthy l- lives and careers that can be lived out through either route. But if you're, if you're in the camp where you're saying, you know, I, I can't wait, or I'm really looking forward to selling this thing one day and retiring on it. There is definitely a formula for that. Totally. Yeah. So on that note, Kevin, I got a big question here to unpack with you. So, um, you see a lot of, uh, entrepreneurs, business owners come to you, um, looking at the sale of their company at whatever point in their career they want to do that. Uh, so let's talk about two scenarios. So scenario one is entrepreneur comes to you and they say, uh, all right, Kevin, I want to kind of, I want to trend, I want to create a transaction here. I want to, I want to cash out. Um, and you look at their business and you're like, wow, this is amazing. This business has so much value. Mm. Um, I think we can create something really special for you here. Um, what does that look like? And on the flip side, entrepreneur comes to you and says the same thing and you look at it and you're like, honestly, man, there's really not a ton of value here. What's the difference between those two businesses? It is a big question. Thanks. It's a big question. And I'm sure there are a lot of things and we can certainly kind of unpack them. But I think that from, you know, that's what most listeners are are really wondering is, you know, I'm kind of here on my entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. When I get there down that road over the course of that time, I'm having a ton of fun right now. I want to keep doing this, but at some point I'm not going to, um, what, what's the difference at the end? Yeah. So I guess what, what, what I'll just say is kind of a blanket statement is, you're talking to an M and A advisor, uh, an I banker. My role is to help you transact, and so this conversation is extremely exciting for me because um, I, I'm like we're beginning with the end in mind. Mm, totally. I'm not the person that's going to help uh, you as a business owner uh, execute on any of these points that I'm going to bring up. These are based on these are prerequisites for you. Th- these are prerequisites yeah. exactly. That's a great way to put it, Benji. So, you know, I think that the first one that comes to mind is around the predictability of cash flow. Right. So, you know, if you think about selling your business, someone's going to buy your business. Why is that person going to buy your business? Well, they're going to buy it uh, because they want to earn a return. They want to put their money somewhere and they want to have that return come back to them uh, by way of cash flow. And so, and the only way to do that um, as an investor is to be assured of the future cash flows of that business. Um, and so if you're sitting there as a business owner thinking, how predictable are my future cash flows? If your answer is, well, I go project to project and you know what? I know that I'm going to find that next project. Uh, but I don't know if somebody else knows that they're going to find that mm-hmm. next project, then it's probably not very predictable. Right. If, if you think, if you have a system where you're like, Hey, every month on the first of the month, people's credit cards are charged. It's pretty predictable. Right. And so, um, the predictability of that future cash flow is what drives value today. Right. Amazing. So let's unpack that a little bit uh, because it's such a powerful point. I mean, it's interesting. You also brought that one up as the first one that creates that difference. A couple things, I think, uh, that can create predictable cash flow. So you talked about like actual recurring revenue. So if I'm a landscaping company and I do... uh, large uh, hardscape install projects that are like $200,000, but they're total Mm one-offs. That may not be as good as if I have a huge client base of recurring stratas or HOAs, commercial properties doing maintenance maintenance, where it's, it's like clockwork every month and it bills to a credit card on the first or the 15th or whatever month you're saying that's the better approach ideally. Mm. It's a really, you know, I'll, I'll just broadly say yes. Um, but it's, I caution the, the better. Um, so if you think about the recurring revenue, that's mm-hmm. great. Typically you're going to have maybe, uh, in the example you're giving, uh, maybe they're smaller clients. And so, yeah, is it good? Yeah, I would say that it's probably good, but if you have lots of small landscaping projects, it's maybe harder to get to that high re- revenue, number. higher revenue. And so what's more valuable? Well, I think about more valuable based on the, the turns of EBITDA, the amount of, um, you know, so if you talk about like a value of a business is typically going to be like one times revenue or five times EBITDA. Um, and so how do you get that number from five to six times EBITDA or seven times EBITDA 
or from one times revenue to two times revenue. That's what I'm talking about. The multiplier. About. The yeah. multiplier. And so that multiplier is better served on the recurring revenue model. Yeah. But um, transacting, it's nice on project based so long as you have some diversification amongst your clients. Right. And I just want to, we, th- we throw out a term in there just in, in case anyone doesn't fully understand it. When we say EBITDA, this is essentially a slightly different take on what is like the net net profit, but adjusted its earnings before income tax depreciation amortization, right? That's correct. Is, is essentially what it means. So when, when you're looking at a valuation of a company, um, it's going to be a multiple of that annual EBITDA, so your annual earnings before income tax depreciation amortization. That's right. It, it yeah. occurs to me just as you're talking about that, like there are some business models that I think um, uh, contractors might think are going to be super, super valuable that actually are not because of what you just said. So like... I think in the prep block we were talking about, um, it's it's actually difficult to like sell a like be be a developer and sell your business. Mm. Huge, huge jo- like huge job sizes, huge dollar amounts. But this predictability thing is missing. Yeah, and I th- I'm, I'm I'm assuming there'd be a handful of other examples like that within sort of because like you're chasing big projects. You're chasing time, big right? projects all the time, yeah. and that's from a you know a business purchaser is looking at that going, eh, looks like a lot of work. Somebody's got to do that. Yeah. Um, that's that, I just going back to that sort of things that might surprise business owners, things they might be unaware of. I think that's another one as well. Yeah, Kevin, let me ask you this as well. On the note of of, of uh, predictability of future cash flow, um, is this a thing? A business that has a real marketing and sales engine, and the team, the systems that that brings in recurrent like uh, a, a recurring number of leads qualified leads there's a sales system that'll actually close deals on a, in a predictable way as opposed to a company that doesn't where it completely leverages on the business owner is that a big thing yeah i would say that the the sales and marketing process is definitely a mo- it's a functional area that is a marker of best in class businesses where right. you can have a process that isn't necessarily doesn't hinge on your cmo or your, your best salesperson to drive your business forward, there's a process that you can bring individuals in. It's repeatable, and therefore it's scalable. Um, and so you can take that personal goodwill off of individuals, the business owner, whomever, and you can place it onto the processes around totally. your sales and marketing. If you can do that, then what you're doing is you're moving your personal goodwill into corporate goodwill, which is very valuable. Totally, yeah, absolutely. So huge difference between... Pete's plumbing versus a powerful brand that's not related to Pete the founder. That's uh, where, where the in the in the in the public's eye they see that brand, and there's a great marketing team with a ton of great marketing systems. Super steady lead flow. That's Super predictable. Steady lead flow. You have like a very very structured sales process you and a know large the sales team. Of your sales team not you have hinged on one plan. person. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Like it, when you look at high performing sales org sales orgs, there's a formula for that yeah. too. Yeah, I would say that all of that is, you're bang on. Um, You know, when we think about sales and marketing, uh, there can be markers in there for value. So my original point, the predictability of future cash flow. Yeah, I mean, I get it. If you have a contract where people are going to pay you, that is cash flow. But if you typically have, say, 50 sales leads in a month, and you're going to market to sell your business, and, you know, recently it's been 75 or 100, I would say as a buyer, that's it creates comfort around that future predictability, mm, totally. right? So there are other markers. There are other value drivers other than just cash. Absolutely. Awesome. That's a really, really good first point, uh, the predictability of future cash flow. And, and like we said, there's a number of facets to that. What would be, what would be a second marker of a business that, that's built with a ton of value? Yeah, I would say um, the big word that comes to mind is systemization. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I want to reiterate, as I said at the beginning of this segment, you know, we aren't the guys to do that. I think that, you know, Igor, you and I have known each other for a really long time. I think that Breakthrough Academy is a group. And the reason I love it is because your clients, your customers, uh, your members are going to be members that have this first point systemization. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you're able to create a document, um, a a process that documents how your business operates, it's going to uh, decrease risk and stabilize those future returns and stability of the company going forward. You don't need Igor to be there for maybe us to be having this podcast. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So this this systemization piece, and you're right, it, it is a really big word. Uh, what kind of things are you seeing very practically uh, when you when you open the box, like, you know, entrepreneur comes to you and you're like, wow, this is an amazing business, huge value here. You, you open the box, what sits inside from a systemization perspective? Yeah, so the first thing that comes to mind, um, and I'm sure we could do a whole segment just on this, 
But the first thing that comes to mind is the way that your company uh, goes about setting and achieving goals. Mm. And so if you have, you know, I don't know, I'll just throw some stuff at the wall. Um, you have a, a weekly management meeting, you have uh, a, a, a quarterly goal setting session, um, you have weekly check-ins to how you're progressing against those goals that are, you know, data driven, uh, whether it's, you know, you're hitting this revenue number, you're hitting this number of leads. Um, and then you can work back into a situation where you say, Hey, you know, something's breaking down at this point in the process. I think that's all driven by your goal setting and the way that you track your achievement towards those goals. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's a really good point. We, we, so we talk a lot about this, right? That it's that those rituals that are almost baked into the organization and everyone in the organization where there's an annual strategic planning cycle, quarterly strategic planning meeting with, with the key stakeholders. We've got weekly goal setting interviews that are holding accountability to everyone. And I guess, Kev, what you're saying is that that's got to be baked in to the, um, to the actual fabric of the people in the organization, right? Yeah, yeah and I, well, I think what I would say to that is you're exactly right, but it can't just be um, like an unwritten rule, mm. right? Like I think I totally. think that's where, um, as, as good as it might be, and I'm not, again, we're talking, in, I, I'm talking idealistically here, um, but it can be baked into the culture, but it's really nice for guys like me and buyers who know nothing about your business. Like remember, the person that's gonna be buying your business doesn't know your business. And so they're right, going to come yeah. in and say, you're going to say, Hey, don't worry. The team every week they're on, tr they're right. on target. Nobody's late for work today. And I'm a buyer saying, how do I know that? Yeah. Totally. Like, like what happens if they're late? Show That's me such a great point. Show me. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So what are the actual like strategic planning processes written? Like how, what do they look like? What are the weekly goal setting interview? What's the meeting structure? What yes. documents are used in the meeting? You're looking at you this stuff. Your like you're, you're, you, you are doing deep analysis. When you look at a business, this is the stuff that you'd be looking for. When you say I, I need evidence, like this is the stuff that you're looking for. That's right. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, can I make a point or do you want to go? No, go ahead. Okay. Just really quick going back to something we were talking about earlier. There's like on the systemization piece, you know, if, if you, um, there's two streams here. If you love your business, you love working with customers, you love the craft that you deliver. There's nothing wrong with doing that forever and, and, and saving up retirement and, and, and that being your, your, your route through business. And there's a rich life to be had that way. If you want to do the other stream, we say this all the time, like it sounds kind of weird. You need to make yourself completely redundant, completely 100%. redundant. Yeah. Like you're not even a person. I've heard, I have a really good, uh, good friend of ours. Uh, Kit says this all the time. He's like, I don't want to have business cards in my own business. I don't even want to be a name. There's like, I, I, like I'm just totally, totally behind totally. the scenes. And I think that's a really, that's just a catchy way to think about it. I want to make myself totally redundant within my yeah. own business. And and that's not to say that, um, that you, uh, you can't be a part of anything, but you really don't have to be the business functions exceptionally well, whether you are there or not. Mm -hmm. right? I, I would, I would expand on that just a little bit. What I would say is, I mean, we love hearing that business owners are redundant. It's okay if you like, working in your business. The distinction I would make is that, is uh, your role uh, replicatable? So um, like, let's just say uh, I'm redundant in my business, but I love hosting a podcast. Right. Well, go ahead and host it because if I'm not here, there's a script for how somebody else can do it. Right. Great. Totally. So you're redundant, but you're still working in your right. business. Yeah. yeah. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, on on this note, uh, again, is such an important point. This 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 systemization. Um, there's probably another element here I would imagine, which is like documented and baked in standard operating procedures, competency models for all the skills, uh, onboarding and training programs for new staff. Uh, what, how do you typically see the distinction there between companies that really don't have much value and those that do? Yeah, I think this is one of the ones where I would say eats value. So like there are companies that are sold for, you know, outrageous amounts of money that don't have great documentation. Maybe they don't have employment contracts, you know, something that's pretty basic. It just eats at value. That's a and really so, great way to look and, at it. And so, <laughs> and so it's not that your business isn't going to be saleable because you don't have employment agreements. It's that it, it adds risk to a buyer. How do I know what the arrangement is with your employee? Maybe you, maybe it says, maybe you tell them that they have four weeks vacation, but where do, how do they know, how do totally. I know that? Yeah. If I'm a buyer, it's, I'm seeing added risk here, right? Yeah. If, added risk. If we got to bring on new employees and there's no systemized way to onboard and train them, 
that's risk for me. That's just risk. Yeah. So it's, I, I think there's a, like the point I want to make is just that it doesn't mean your business isn't saleable. It's just, these are things that optimize the value. How do you increase that multiple? Yeah. The multiple of EBITDA that we talked yep. about hundred percent. Yeah. So for, for listeners, if you haven't developed really defined job descriptions inside of employment agreements, if you haven't built uh, robust onboarding programs for new staff, training and development over the long term. You have standardized operating procedures for all sorts of stuff that the organization does. Uh, that is a worthwhile endeavor to build into because you're going to see that money come back in dividends. Totally. Mm-hmm. More, right? We talked about the the analogy to the house and, and building value into the house. You know, this is like spending $100,000 on a kitchen and some bathrooms because it's going to add way more than that in value back, right? Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah, really good points around around systemization, Kev. Uh, what what would be a next? Uh, what 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 would be another big factor that adds value? Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm totally aware that some of this stuff is easier said than done, but I would say a diversification of your products and services. Mm. So, um, you know, I get it. There are secret sauce to every business, and there may be a key. Uh, uh, product or service that you lean on. Yep. If you can get away from that blockbuster product or service, you know, I think we just went through a pandemic or we're in the pandemic. I'm not totally sure right now. Um, <laughs> but if something like that comes down and hits you and your key to the business is that you have great retail storefront, um, it might not serve you as well than having, you know, 50% of your business retail and 50% online. Mm-hmm. And so the diversification of that revenue stream helps stability, um, uh, stabilize the predictability of that future cash flow. Which we've seen that with the members we work with over the last year and a half, right? Like, like the the, 100%. the people that are. I, I don't want to say one trick pony. It's it's it, that's a bit reductive. But mm-hmm. if you're if you're just doing interior renovations and you get hit by COVID, you are way more derailed than a business owner that does, you know, landscape construction, landscape maintenance. They also have a few other side hustles or they've got different verticals that they're operating within. And we've seen those members bounce back from this quite a bit faster and they didn't, they, it just didn't hurt them as deeply. Yeah, totally. And there are all sorts of other market fluctuations. I think, again, we're talking about from a buyer's perspective that just adds risk, right? Like if you're a storm roofer, and that's what your entire business is driven off of insurance work and roofing. Right. And there's a large regulatory change or some sort of process change in the insurance industry in the United which States. Which is happening. Yeah. Every happening. month like, right now. Yeah. Like, or you don't get the storm. Yeah. Or you don't get the storm. You, for, yeah. you are susceptible if you don't have an actual retail direct to consumer route to your marketing. Mm-hmm. Right. If you're reliant on a storm coming through and insurance companies paying for it and that's 100% of your revenue, what happens if the storms don't come through? or if there's a change in the insurance structure and you don't have the marketing capabilities and sales capabilities to build the same revenue to the consumers. One, thing, the consumer. one thing I'm seeing, which is really cool, it's, it's pretty inspiring. Like some of our highest performing members, they're going from, a lot of them are going from uh, this company to group of companies, mm. right? So it's like Bow Home Services to Bow Group of Companies. Beyond foam to beyond group of companies, they've 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 stacked on these different services and products that they offer, for sure with this intentionality in mind. But it's it's that is um, certainly a, a trademark of some of our like the best yeah. of our best. Yeah, yeah, awesome, Kev. What what would be another another key point that you see on the regular? Um, I think that so so. At the beginning of the segment, we talked about uh, it's okay to run this as a lifestyle business right. uh, versus you know setting it up for sale necessarily. I think one of the things when you run it more as a lifestyle business is you start to um, have redundant assets within your business. And so what I mean by redundant assets, it could mean anything from you run it like your own little piggy bank and you have your boat mm. and your car and all the rest of it in it. That's okay. In, in my world, uh, we can we can remove those expenses and say to a buyer, hey, you know, this isn't a real expense of the business. It's called normalizing uh, a normalization of your, your profit and loss statement. Um, that's okay. But, you know, to really showcase your business, I would say you want to remove that type of behavior within your business uh, as early as possible so that you can really show how this business is behaving. Another example, which maybe is a bit more technical, is on the balance sheet. So are you going to, do you carry lots of extra cash in your business? Mm. Um, or do you extend your accounts receivable because for no good reason other than maybe you don't have a good AR person or you don't have an AR person. And so people take mm. advantage of that. And it's okay because a lot of your customers, you have very few bad debts. Um, but then you're also one of these people that are, are fairly risk adverse. And so you pay your payables immediately. 
Well, if you pay your payables immediately and you don't collect your AR very quickly, then you're not running the company very efficiently and you're going to, it's going to hurt you when you go to sell your business. Like yeah. that's not a good look for like for you as the seller to the buyer. That's not a good look. And that's saint, a great way to put it. And, yeah. and saint, and saint, like the other one you mentioned is like having a bunch of extra vehicles, trucks, equipment lying around. That's actually be even like, that's, that's not a good, that's not a good look either. You know, if they're just sitting idle collecting dust, like what are they doing there? That's is exactly right. So the idea there would be, you know, could the investment in that asset, if you sold the truck and you got 50 grand for it, could that money be used elsewhere better to grow your business? Could you invest in your business with that yeah. 50 grand is better? It because, is it because those vehicles, those resources are a risk or is it because it's a sign, it's indicative of like a different, like behavior that's not desirable or decision making that's not desirable? Uh, I would say the former. Um, I'll give you an analogy. You know, we work in, in finance and in corporate finance. If I bought uh, uh, a tractor and put it in our office, it would collect us. We would have nothing to do with it. Now, the value of our business would go up by the cost of the tractor. Right. Or some fraction of that, depending on what the resale value is. And every year, assuming our business did nothing, changed nothing else, the value of the business would go down because the tractor depreciates. But if the tractor is generating income, mm -hmm. then our business is going to grow in value. Okay. And so if you have trucks that are sitting idle... Um, yeah, sure. Maybe the decision making is is not great, but that that's okay because the business owner is likely going to be mostly bought out or wholly bought out. Um, but the company's assets are not uh, behaving in an efficient way, and so therefore they're redundant. Totally. So I would say you want to clean that type of stuff up. So you don't have a tractor outside your office. We don't have a tractor outside or inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, totally. So it, uh, I want to come back to a point here, Benji, really great way to put it. It's not a good look. I think that as, as a business owner, you should be conscious about the optics of your financial statements, right? right. right. Year, year to year. <clears throat> uh, these are pretty easy fixes, right? There's no mm -hmm. need to carry, uh, even if they're great cash producers, like rental properties and things like that inside your operating company, there's a pretty easy fix to set up a holding company and move that kind of stuff out. The optics of your operating company are solely the optics of your holding company, right? It's, there's no other stuff in there. It's a very clean picture, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a great point. Uh, you know, I think I think when we're we're talking about kind of purifying um, your financial statements, it's like you can quickly go to your accountant. You can come to somebody like me and say, "Hey, there's some glaring marks here that you right. just want to you want to fix before we go to market." And you know, we'll often help with that type of stuff because it's quick planning. Yeah. Uh, but there's other stuff that takes longer to plan for. And so, yeah, I would just recommend getting in touch with your advisor as soon as possible for, for this particular item. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, awesome. What, 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 what other kind of items do we have here that are big? Yeah, so one that, one that comes to mind that is maybe a little uh, redundant if when you hear it at first as a business owner is, is growth. So, um, mm. you know, it's so common for, you know, uh, the retail investor in the public markets to buy at the high and sell at the low. I think that's the opposite of the right. way to make money, right? <laughs> Things are really hot. FOMO kicks in. You want to buy it. It tanks and you say, ah, I'm not going to buy anymore. Right. Uh, we're going through that right now with Bitcoin. Like, I don't know that people are buying a lot of Bitcoin, even though it's at a, I don't know, multi-year low, right? Right. Not that I'm a Bitcoin advocate, but the idea is you don't want to buy high and you don't want to sell yep. low. Um, and so growth within your private business is viewed similarly. So uh, growth is going to have you uh, receive the most value for your company, even if it's relatively small growth stagnation and declining results are going to uh, cause perceived risk to go up. And uh, that is ultimately going to hurt you uh, pretty substantially on the value piece. And I understand that, especially in private business, but all businesses, they go through cycles. Mm -hmm. The problem that I'm, I'm, I want uh, all the viewers to get away from is, you know, you're on this high coming out of COVID. Let's say you're doing really, really well. Yeah. Best years ever. Yeah. Best years. I'm just going to ride it. I'm going to ride it. And then what happens is you're going to see a storm coming or the storm hits and you're like, you know what? Now I'm going to sell. It's like, you know, sell, sell when you're on the up so that you can receive the most value for your business. So mm -hmm. you actually, you're looking at the trajectory. You're looking at trailing data. You're, you're, uh, I don't know what the, if it is it a three year time frame? Is it longer than that? But you, you want to see a, a graph or a curve that's sort of pointed at a certain angle. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So I'd, I'd say like five year results are pretty common for buyers okay. to dig into. Um, mm. so, you know, you'll see ups and downs in those five years, but you know, three years is probably a good number, Benji, where you're saying what's happening in the last three years, assuming you check those boxes from a buyer's perspective, then the next, uh, most important question and to close a transaction, the most important question is what are current results? So it's trailing 12 months. It's how was last month? How was last month? We're approaching closing, let's say in August, cause we're filming this in June. 
uh, how was how was July, mm-hmm. right? And you're moving forward because totally. the buyer wants to know, like, are there any flags here before I write a big check? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, one thing we talk a ton about is this like strategic planning process, goal setting process, super important. If if you're looking in the next five years that you might want to have some sort of transaction that you're you're very intentionally mapping out nice, consistent, smooth revenue growth. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like, does does a smart business seller know this and sort of plan their marketing and sales initiatives and budget accordingly? Be like, I'm going to sell in three to five years. I really want to make this. I want to make that graph, as I said, look as desirable as possible. Yeah, I, you know, I one of my first days on the job ever, I, we sat in front of a fellow, um, uh, I actually forget his name, but he very, very successful a uh, businessman based out of New York. He was here giving a, uh, a breakfast chat. And he, he said, um, it was serendipitous. That it was like, I think my first day of work. But uh, he said, when you're building your business, you have to build it like you're about to sell it. Um, and so to answer your question, Benji, yes, that is very common. Uh, sorry, very is the wrong word. It's common. I love getting those calls three to five years before sale. And they say, hey, I'm thinking about selling. What should I do? Maybe I'll introduce them to, to BTA. Um, but uh, at that point, um, a lot of work is going gonna, is gonna to happen for that business owner. And it's going to be probably a totally different way to operate the business than they have been for the last 20 years or 10 years. Mm. And so there's, there's unknowns there. And mm-hmm. so um, maybe I'm getting long-winded, but I think that the answer to your question is, sure, do that. The best thing to do, though, is just start. Mm-hmm. Just start investing your business as though you're going to sell it because who knows when you're actually going to sell it. Totally. And I think that, you know, for listeners, whether you think that you may in the next five years or you're like, I'm, there's no chance, you're not going to die owning this thing. Yeah. Right. And, and you want this, this organization to be able to get top dollar, whether it's five years from now or when you're 92 years old. Yeah. Right. hundred percent. Um, one of the other things, uh, may, maybe more of a minor point, I don't know, Kevin, you tell me, you talk about documentation. Wait, what does that mean? Yeah, so I mean, we touched on this a little bit earlier. I think from from my perspective, it's assuring that you can decrease that risk profile for the buyers um, that that are coming in to own your company. Now, the 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 asterisk there would be a lot of business owners in the small middle market go through something called a management buyout, and so they have their employees become the owners of the company. I think that's totally great. I think it's required for some businesses. Um, that typically won't yield the highest value. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, your employees maybe don't have all the resources um, to be able to buy your business for top dollar. So they're going to offer, you know, you're going to offer them some, you know, reduction in the purchase price, if you will, um, some deal. And then you'll probably give them very favorable payment terms, like paying you over time. Um, And I think if you go that route, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this is that your documentation, it just is what it is. Your employees understand your business and that's okay. But if we uh, were to go to somebody like me who knows nothing about your storm roofing business, uh, I'm going to need more things documented than you could probably ever imagine, right? (laughs) Uh, Because I know nothing about the business. And so the more documentation, the better. It means that I can go through due diligence better, right? I can hire professionals that say, hey, I need all this documentation. They can confirm it for me. Um, uh, And then in that way, it decreases my risk, which should increase value. Yeah, totally. On the note of documentation is, um, I know one thing that, that I've observed, even really smart, successful contracting companies just not put much effort into is just really great legal infrastructure where you've got even like your stuff as blatant as like your customer contracts, mm-hmm. employment agreements, uh, lease agreements on your properties, like even just that kind of stuff is really not in order. Is Does that, does that add perceived risk? Absolutely, yeah. It's actually a great point. We can just touch on it quickly. So I think customer contracts is something that in the small middle market is like overlooked so much. Mm. Um, uh, you know, let's just say you're a landscaper and you just know that every year or every month or whatever the... Uh, cadence is you visit these clients and you, you know, perform your services. Um, That's great. And that client might have been with you for five years. That's great. But I don't know as the buyer, is this just because you bring them a case of beer and they just love you? Totally. Um, So what I would say is if you can, if you can just say, hey, you know, Johnny, I know I've been servicing you for five years. Um, uh, Do you mind if we just document this? Can we put it in writing? Can we just put it in writing where it just says like we have a three-year contract and it just rolls over every year? Johnny's going to say sure because of course you can't make anybody do anything. He can always cancel the contract. But from a buyer's perspective, uh, you might not have a recurring revenue business, but you just created one. Right. 
At totally. least the perception That's a of really one. good tip. Yeah. 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 So while legal stuff does seem expensive, I mean, I've spent so much money in the last bunch of years just on legal infrastructure. It's, it's, there's no active work. It's mm-hmm. just paperwork. And while it seems insane to spend, uh, to, you know, pay those hourly rates to get that much stuff made, it's, it's probably a pretty good investment for yeah. the long term, isn't it? Well, it comes back to your first point. Do you want to invest in your business, right? Or do you want to run it like a lifestyle? I mean, you run a private business. You don't even have a requirement to produce financial statements. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. You don't. Yeah. You just, I mean, you got to pay your taxes. But I think if you invest in doing a review engagement, so a level above uh, notice to reader, or invest even more in doing an audit, pretty expensive. Um, those things, guess what? They decrease risk. If you have an audited set of financial statements for somebody like me, it makes me very excited because I can go to a buyer and mm-hmm. say, you can rely on these. You don't need to dig in to them because totally. they have less Deloitte assurance. Has. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Kevin, these are such, such good points. Um, But let's let's do a quick recap. Totally. I think it's worth it. Okay, so what what did we get into here? We talked about predictability of future cash flow, number one. Whether it's recurring or you've got great marketing and sales And being able to show that to a guy like Kevin. We talked about systemization get like make make yourself not totally redundant but if you're going to create a role for yourself make that role replicatable we talked about the diversification of products and services so you know adding new verticals uh we talked about documentation quite a bit we talked about that consistent sales and marketing program so easy to forecast your revenue is predictable strong brand steady lead flow really structured sales process high performing sales team beautiful sales collateral results that come in all of it. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this. Is I thought this one was really interesting. The removal of redundant assets, having a bunch of trucks and tractors and equipment lying around, is not adding the value to your business that you might think. You should get rid of it if it's not actively doing something. And then we talked about growth trajectory. So being on the up and up when you go to sell. You guys yeah. could come for my job. So, <laughs> so, so those are the seven big ones. I, uh, I think we talked a little bit as well, but a couple honorable mentions. So we won't spend as much time on these ones, but what are maybe a couple other things that business owners should be aware of before we get to our last couple questions here? Yeah. So reduce client, uh, and, and supplier concentration. So right. yeah, you might have a business that does millions in profit and tens of millions in revenue, and that's really great. Um, but your biggest client does 80% of both profit and revenue. Mm. Um, there's going to be significant risk around that. And so as a buyer, uh, you, you'll probably still pay a, a fair value for it, but um, you will structure it so that if you know that client ever leaves, I don't have to pay you mm-hmm. or something like that. And so I would say you want to get away from that. Um, recurring revenue p- plays into that predictability of future cash flow. I think recurring revenue, um, at least when I think about you know popular culture today, it feels like a tech company. It doesn't need to be. If you can get multi-year contracts that are uh, token because you have a great relationship, they will show that there Absolutely. is some predictability to that future cash flow. Um, legal and tax, as you brought up, uh, Igor, I think. Uh, you can't overstate setting things up in an appropriate way. Yes, it costs money, but you know, it's typically low annual fee and the upfront fee um, is a drop in the bucket. If you think about the eventual sale price that you're going to have Um, structure for tax, you know, this is something that will take at, you know, at least two years if you're going to restructure your company to play through to value. And at the end of the day, but there are some really great incentives in Canada around the lifetime capital gains exemption, which um, you know, if you think about all the spending that's happening in the government now, uh, I don't know if all of that t- that incentive is going to be around for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and so that allows, you know, I don't know, something like $900,000 in... in uh, per individual. Per individual um, in, in tax-free uh, capital gains. And so, uh, you know, making sure that you can take advantage of something like that if you do see a f- sale coming up in the future. Um, uh, and then uh, contracts with significant clients, I think, again, it plays into that predictable revenue. But those are just a few points. Okay, yeah. awesome. I love it. Um, I, I wanted to ask... Um, for our listeners, can you share, are there any like benchmarks, like like numbers, KPIs, I don't know, like revenue, you know, retained earnings, certain profit margins, EBITDA, like when does the world of selling your business really open up? Is there a benchmark or a place that business owners need to get to where this whole conversation becomes much easier for them? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, there is. Um, And so this is where, you know, our original question, you know, how's the market right now? Uh, It's white hot. And so, you know, what does that mean? It means that the buyer buyer's appetite for smaller transactions is growing. 
you know, maybe traditionally over the last 25 years, maybe that number was something like 10 million in EBITDA. Pretty big businesses, yeah. right? So $10 million in annual earnings. Yeah. That so not revenue, but but actual profit, profit, essentially earnings before income tax. Yeah. All but maybe in the last uh, six, seven years, that number has dropped substantially. I would say that uh, your universe of possibility as a business owner opens up if you can get to 2 million EBITDA. I think if, if people are out there thinking that, you know, lifestyle isn't the way we're necessarily going to go uh, and selling their business. I would say if you can target two million in EBITDA, uh, your your options really open up. Okay, awesome, cool. very good, Kevin. We talked a lot about uh, great points around structural stuff that exists within a business of high value. I got a really important question for you. I want to close with when you look at the individual, the human, the entrepreneur that's in the driver's seat, that's sitting in the cockpit of that business. When you look at organizations that have built huge value and those who haven't, what's the difference in the mindset, in the head of the people that you deal with? Yeah, you guys are asking the tough questions, right? Um, yeah, so if I think about all of our transactions, which I think would be representative of the market, just given our size and uh, how long we've been around, um, I would say that the common thread is that the business owners that really build those highly valuable businesses are very intentional in their goal setting. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think that all business owners have to be goal oriented to some degree. I'm not saying that they're just goal oriented. I'm saying that they are very intentional about what they're attempting to achieve here. And so you see that through the implementation of systems. I mean, it's hard to roll out a system like totally. Rockefeller Habits or whatever mm -hmm. the system to go to BTA and be a participant. And, you know, all of these things, they take a lot of work. And so you have to be very intentional about why you're doing it. Um, of course, there are outliers. Like there are businesses, we've represented businesses that don't even have a website, right? <laughs> Before we went to market, we had them build a website. But, um, uh, you know, sometimes those are just great businesses. They're on the right wave, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right. But I would say the common thread, Igor, um, amongst really successful business owners where they achieve those really high multiples, quick transactions, they can retire, uh, you know, knowing that they did their best uh, as far as building value. Uh, it's the intentional goal setting around it. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's really a hallmark of a great entrepreneur when you can, um, and I love, I don't know if you've read Stephen Covey uh, books and, and The Seven Habits, but it talks about all things are, are created twice. They're created once in your mind mm. and then they're created into reality. And, uh, and, and I, I think we all see that on the regular where real high performers in business and entrepreneurship are able to craft something in their head and then have the tool belt and the grit and the skills to actually go bring that into reality and do that consistently over and over again, right? Yeah, grit. Love the word. Love the book too. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great... Um key as well, Igor. Awesome. Kevin, so good, man. Uh, so many great points. We, we talked about a ton of cool stuff. I'd, I'm just, I'm so fascinated by by this subject and, and, and I've brought this up many times before, but it's just, it's so neat to observe how people spend years, decades of hard work, same amount of time, same amount of effort and energy, and some create absolute greatness and hugely valuable assets and some create just a good little business, but they both spent the same amount of time. And it's just been so cool to unpack what the difference in that, in that journey looks like. So it's been, it's been super awesome. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having really me. Good. Thanks Benji. Um, and Kev, if people want to find you, talk to you, whether it's about uh, like M&A specifically and the potential sale of their organization in the next year, in the next five years, or just to unpack some of this stuff a little bit with you, maybe they're only 25, 30 years old, but they're like, by the time I'm 50, I'm going to sell this. What should I be doing? Um, can they reach out? to you yeah absolutely i mean linkedin is a great resource kevin shaw um i work at baker tilly corporate finance so you can find uh, me and my whole team and what we've done on our website at baker tilly.ca slash corporate finance amazing thanks kevin it's been it's been super fun great thanks guys hey if you enjoyed this show hit that subscribe button it's what allows us to produce more awesome content for you totally for free